Uh, hi everyone, welcome to today's lecture. Today, after spending two lectures talking more abstractly about uh, how testing works in terms of activities like planning, the test design, and so on, and talking about what makes testing systematic, uh, talking about the relationship between testing and requirements, etc., we're going to get into more specifics, and we're going to talk about some specific examples today. And we're mainly going to focus today on one of the sort of groups of testing methods or systematic methods, which are namely black box tests. Um, and we talked a little bit already about black box versus white box. So I'm going to, uh, we already covered sort of what makes something a systematic testing method. So I told you that a systematic testing method is a method that has a system for creating tests and some measure of completeness. Okay. So in order to be systematic, it needs to have a way an orderly way or a rule for creating the tests and a measure for completing them. And the example I gave you was if you're doing like conditions with white box testing, with if statements, you your system for creating them is create a test case that makes every if that makes an if statement true and create a test case that makes the if statement false. And the completion criterion is when every if statement has those two tests created. That would be an example of a systematic testing method that provides coverage of all of your if statements or your conditional statements. Now, uh, today though, we're not talking about white box testing. We're talking about black box methods. And black box methods are uh, the testing methods that are based solely on the requirements or the spec um, and not based at all on any information about the source code, uh, which either is unknown in terms of how you create the when you create the test or it even doesn't exist at this point i.e. you can create the black box test before you ever have any code uh, to test um, this differs from white box as i mentioned because white box uses information about the source code itself to help uh, create the test cases or identify a system for creating the test cases now in terms of black box testing um, there's a bunch of different methods, but there's two that we're going to look at today. The very first one we're going to cover is what's called functionality coverage. And the second one is called input coverage. And most of these systematic methods, uh, whether they're black box or white box, the idea behind these testing methods is that you have to have some mechanism or some notion of coverage because coverage is the idea of, is, is what gives you confidence that the testing actually covers or executes the majority of the software. So in the case of black box, you want to provide coverage of, because you don't know what the code is, you're providing coverage of the requirements. Uh, functionality coverage means that you are making sure you have tests for all the functionality in the software. White box, or sorry, black input coverage, um, also use the requirements, but make sure that you have some sort of coverage of all of the inputs that are possible. Doesn't mean that you have tests for every input. It means you have tests that cover every input, right? And, and that's quite a different thing. Um, you can think about um, coverage as, as being something about having like something that's a representative sample for all of the necessary inputs, for example. Okay, um, and as I've mentioned already, black box methods, they're based on the requirements, the spec, primarily, and they're done independently of the software. So you can actually have somebody creating a test at the same time or even before somebody is writing the code. Uh, and they are pretty much always, almost always based on what we call the functional specification, which is the specification about what the software system should do. Uh, and those are the tests that typically exist at a more system level. Now, what is a functional spec? Well, a functional spec uh, and that's used can take many different forms. Okay, it could be very formal. It could be actually a mathematical set of expressions or mathematical, it could be logical expressions or it could be informal. It could be written in natural language or English. Um, the document you're using in your project that I've written that you're using to ask questions of the client of, that could be considered an informal functional spec. It tells you what types of inputs can go in, what are the expected outputs, and what are the actions that take place for given inputs. So in general, the functional spec contains three kinds of information. And for every kind of information, we can provide a type of testing. The first type of information is the inputs or the intended inputs. So what is the expected inputs for the software? Also, 
what are the corresponding intended actions? I.e., when a certain input comes in, what happens to that input? What, what is that used for? Uh, and lastly is the corresponding intended outputs. Given the inputs, once the intended actions happen, what are the outputs that the user sees? Um, and like I said, in order to do systematic testing of black box, systematic testing, you would focus on one of these and come up with a coverage me method. And the three corresponding coverage methods for each of these types of information are uh, in the case of um, the intended inputs, it's called input coverage, where you base uh, the you come up with tests based on analyzing the inputs. And it's important to know you analyze the inputs independent of their actions or outputs. So there's no information about the actions or outputs that are used. You just focus on the inputs only. Okay? Uh, and the same thing with output coverage. You analyze the intended outputs. You forget about what actions and what inputs lead to them. You just analyze the outputs. And for functionality coverage, you put your focus and your energy on creating tests that are based on analyzing the intended actions, okay? So what happens in the system regardless of the input or output that is used? Um, so those are the three types of black box methods that we're mainly gonna cover in the class. Uh, and the very first one I said we're gonna cover is this third one on the list, which is functionality coverage. And the reason is I think this is one that um, I think it'll be useful to learn this one before the other two. And I'll explain why as we go. So here's an example. And this is a not meant to be a complicated example. It's meant to be an example that is of a size that we can talk about in class. So um, what we're doing is we're going to do what we call systematic functionality testing. And we're going to have a English specification of the function of the software. And in our case, it is this informal requirement that I have here. Given as input two integers x and y, output all numbers smaller than or equal to x that are evenly divisible by y. If either x or y is zero, then output zero. What is this program actually doing? Yeah, so it's exactly. So what it's doing here is it's saying, okay, it's going for all numbers equal or less than x that are evenly divisible by y. So that's what it's actually going to create for you in terms of outputs. Well, forget about the inputs and outputs for now. Um, what we're going to focus on is the functionality. So in terms of the functionality here, what's the first step in doing functionality testing or functionality coverage? The very first step is what we call partitioning. So the first thing we have to do is we have to take this uh, statement, which is the full specification for the program, and we have to partition it into smaller functionality blocks or, or smaller requirements, okay? So we're gonna create a set of small sp separate requirements based on the information that's in this specification. So. And when we say we're going to partition here, what do we mean? Well, uh, what we want to do is we want to make an assumption here. We're going to say, let's see if we can identify all the little parts, all the little requirements that make up this full requirement or this full functionality spec. And let's assume they're all independent, even though they're not. Let's assume that and let's write them all separately. Let's identify them. Can anyone give me an example of what's something in here that is related to functionality that you think of as being a, a partition of what's what's a piece of information here that we could partition out as being unique or separate? The zero clause. What do you mean by the zero clause? 
last thing. So yeah, that if either X or Y is zero, then the output is zero. That's something we could split out, yep. Reads in two numbers, yep. Uh, I'd probably rephrase that and say it accepts two integers as input, right? Um, anything else? Is that it? Does it say anything about how much output it should generate? Yep, the output should be evenly divisible by y, right? That's something that we could separate out. Is there any information about uh, how many, are we outputting one thing, two things, three things? We're outputting a list of integers. Yeah, actually we're outputting zero or more integers, right? Because it really depends. If it, It's possible that there might not be any number smaller than or equal to x that are divisible by y, in which case we output zero things. So we're going to output zero more integers. Uh, we're also that smaller than or equal to x. We can say that all numbers output must be less than or equal to the first input, which is x. And all numbers output must be evenly divisible by the second number, which is y, right? And we can also say that all numbers output must, or output must contain all the numbers that satisfy both those other two requirements I just said. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things we can do. So we could end up with, if we start partitioning, we'll probably end up with something like this. Right? And what I've done here is I've just taken some little quotes from the requirement doc and I've actually sort of written them out as independent statements. Yeah, you're right. It should actually be one. It probably I should put here outputs one or more integer numbers, right? Because um, if x is one or any number greater than it, uh, one is always a possibility. So, but anyway, uh, yeah, that's an oversight on my part. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, okay, but you know what? That's cool. You know what's cool about this? Does everyone understand what was just said? There's a comment in the chat that says. Unless the number for y is zero, then the output will always be at least one for division by one, right? Which means the number one is if x and y are both positive numbers. Wait, are they positive numbers? Did we say this? Hmm, interesting. We never talked about negative numbers. Uh, it could be either. So maybe I might say let's make them positive. It might, but what, you're, what we've all of a sudden done, we haven't even created tests yet, but just the act of splitting this apart is helping us to better understand the requirements. So the point that was made uh, was that it's gonna be the case that if, if we've got two positive numbers, um, one, will, the number one, assuming x and y are great, greater than or equal to one, it'll always be the case that one is a number that will be smaller than or equal to x and, and or does it? Wait, wait. All numbers evenly divisible by the second number. Is one evenly divisible by y then? No, that doesn't make sense. So maybe it is zero. Actually, no, I think I'm okay. But the negative thing is something that we actually didn't talk about, right? So we have to decide here if, if we meant negative or do we mean positive. So we may want to change it and say, you know what? This isn't precise enough and change that R1 to say accepts two positive integers as output as input. So we could do that, right? Do you feel like you already understand the requirement a little better just by doing this? Okay. So let's assume these partitions are okay. Let's assume we're talking about positive integers, but everything else is good. 
Okay. Now, what do we do? We've got partitions, which we said we were going to do, fun partitions of the requirements. So we've broken apart that requirement that we had into a bunch of independent requirements. What do we do now? Well, once we have that, we actually have to create test cases for each of the requirements. So uh, we model each partition as independent and we create separate test cases for each. Okay, so let's consider, let's consider that last one first. If either x or y is zero, then output zero. Okay. What test cases are we gonna need here? What inputs do you need to test this requirement? Well, we know that we have as input an x and a y. So what values of x and y would be good test cases for R6 here, our sixth require, requirement statement? I see someone in here put in, uh, yeah, I see a couple people have answered it. Uh, well, there's the case where x is zero, the case where y is zero, the case where they're both zero, the case where they're both non-zero, right? And so that's what I'm seeing here. Now, uh, that's an interesting one. So one of the things you might wonder is, so we could end up with something like this just for R6, right? So as you can see here, I said, okay, output must be zero in, any, in the case where either the first or second input integer is zero. So I might include the test where they're both zero to see, the case where x is zero, y is not, the case where y is zero, x is not, and neither is zero. Now, those, what I put in brackets there is really the description of what every test does or what every test should be, right? So normally what I would do is I would describe each test first as in what's in those brackets, and then I would come up with inputs that fit the need, right? So both zero is pretty obvious. You have to have zero, zero. X being zero and Y is not could be zero, but Y could be anything, right? Agreed? Yeah, but why would we use one here? Why not use 20? Why not use 30? Why not use 500? Why use one? Easy number, easy is the wrong word, but you're on the right track. Simple is the right word. Remember what we talked about when we talked about agile and how simplicity was something we're interested in? When it comes to test cases, you don't want to overcomplicate things. Keep it as simple as possible. That means don't come up with really fancy values because you never know. You might be coming up with a value that it doesn't work for a completely different reason, right? Like if you decided to, what about if you decided the number I'm going to come up with is 4 trillion? And then you're like, wait a sec, that doesn't actually that's too big for the memory of in this programming language or whatever it is, right? Like, so you could just come up with a value or there's some other reason why that might not work. So in general, you want to keep the simplest numbers. The other thing is that's a good sort of rule to try to follow is when you're doing the tests, you only ever want to really be changing one value at a time. So the first case is two zeros. In the next test case, we change one to one. And then, well, we do actually have a case here where if we, I, I would probably, if I was doing this again, swap T3 and T4 so that you have four test cases where only one value gets changed each time. Uh, but I would recommend doing zero and one as the values because it's simple. So would using X and Y be better? No. Uh, so X and Y are just descriptors for what the values are. You need a test case. That's a description of a test case to say both zero, X zero, Y not, and so on. The actual test case, you need real inputs. So it wouldn't be sufficient to say zero, zero, and then in test two say zero, uh, and then say y not equal to zero. Like that's not a test case. The test case is real inputs that you could input into the, into the program, okay? Cool. Okay.
So uh, moving a step further, like I said, simplest possible uh, is important. You don't want this to be exhaustive. We're not trying every possible combination of X and Y, right? We don't have a test case 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, 5, and so on. We only have 1, 0, 1. Uh, and part of that has to do with the partitions. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide coverage. So the test case test 2 here, 0, 1, this is actually representing all the cases that fit that description, x being 0 and y not being 0. Okay, So we have one test case to represent all those possible values. We don't need every single one. Okay, The key here is, is that we have at least one, one test case for every kind of partition that we're looking at. At least one test case. So. Um, that's a little bit, and now I, I should say we could if we go back, and I, I should go back and say here, one of the things you want to do in this is you could go back even further here and go back and look at the requirements we have right here. And you, this is a good activity for you to do on your own outside of lecture. Uh, you can post it in Slack and I'll comment on it if you want, and other people can. You could go through here and look at these requirements and come up with values that satisfy them, okay? So like for example with R2, output zero or more, actually we you know more integers, right? You would want to have a test here where the output is no integers. One where the output is one integer, that's zero. The output where it's one integer, that's not zero. An output where it's two integers, an output where it's, you know, you might say that's it, or or two or more. You might have two or more as being one group. Okay? So you would pick some tests like that and then you would put values in for them. It's a little trickier with that one because it's it's the requirement is related to the output so then you have to sort of work backwards and say well what input of X and Y lead me to the output of one integer for example. Um, so you could go through you would go through each of these requirements and do that process we did for requirement 6 where we came up with a set of tests for that requirement. We would do a set of tests for all the requirements then what we would do is we would take all those tests, we put them into sort of a larger set, and that would be our test suite that provides us black box functionality coverage. Now here's the other nice thing and benefit of doing simple, like we set up here. If we do simple and we mainly stick the zeros, ones, and so on, guess what? There's going to be cases where we may have the same inputs satisfy tests in multiple different requirements. So by keeping all the values simple, it'll allow us to easily identify when the same test satisfies more than one of our needs. So it'll allow us to kind of optimize a little bit by, ha by duplicating repeated tests. Whereas if we chose random numbers here, uh, it might be different. We might not realize if we had two tests that were both for x0, y0 in two different requirements, if in one of them we randomly chose 0 and 35 and the other one we randomly chose 0 and 40, we may not realize that 0, 40 and 0, 35 were actually evaluating the same thing when x is 0 and y is not 0. So by doing it simple, we're more likely to come across those duplicates and be able to remove them, thus optimizing things. Any questions? Seeing none, I'll move along. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, is that there's a couple things to remember here, right? I said that what we want, we're talking about is black box is one example of systematic methods of testing. And in a system, you need a system for creating tests and a system for knowing when you're done. Well, in black box functionality coverage, what's the system for creating tests? Well, the system for creating tests <coughs> um, is that we take every functional requirement right and we treat them as separate and what we will do then is we will create tests for every requirement assuming they're independent and we're done when we have test cases for each of those partition requirements so that is our completion criterion when there's tests for every partition requirement and the system is to partition 
create tests for every partition. That's the system for creating, and the system for completion is providing tests for all of those partitions. Okay? Um, another thing to remember is that functionality testing or coverage, I should say, is is not the same as acceptance testing, right? So with this black box functionality coverage, we're providing test cases based on the specification, right? But we're making that assumption about all of those requirements being independent. Therefore, it's not like we're not going to test things like how acceptance testing. We're not going to test how a user or a customer would really be using the software, right? For example, uh, so therefore, acceptance testing isn't a replacement, or sorry, systematic black box functionality coverage or any black box technique isn't a replacement for acceptance testing. Acceptance testing, you may have things, let's say we're taking a banking example. Uh, I might try, if I was doing withdrawal and I had a $500 limit, I might, that as one of my requirements, I would have a test which tests when someone requests to withdraw below 500, above 500, at 500, whatever, one or more above 500. Um, but I would test that around that 500, but I wouldn't test an acceptance test about how, for example, a user really uses the banking system, which might involve like going to an ATM where a typical customer will go, they will deposit checks, they will check their balance, then they will withdraw a certain amount of cash and then they will exit. So that might be a standard sort of thing that a customer does. That isn't going to get tested by what we're doing. What we're doing is going to independently test each of the requirements in there, but it's not going to test the use cases or operational tests of how a user really would go about or a customer would really go about using the system. So just to keep in mind, this is not a replacement for acceptance testing. Uh, that's what I was trying to say. Um, the other thing I want to mention is, and I think a lot of you in first year, you would have done uh, physics definitely. Uh, you may not have done chemistry, biology, but you probably did those in high school, right? Yeah, So, you, but you're familiar with hypothesis testing, right? In hypothesis testing, you know, what we do is we define a hypothesis we devise an experiment to test that hypothesis and then based on the results of the experiment we draw conclusions that is you know the classic scientific method and the thing that's interesting about testing is that testing software and black box testing is an experiment right uh, that is what we are doing okay what is our hypothesis our hypothesis is that the software works as expected, right? The software meets the requirements. It meets the functional specification. What's, how, what's the system? What is the, the actual experiment we're devising? Well, we are actually devising an experiment where we are breaking apart every part of the requirement. For each partition, we're testing it. And then if all those tests pass, we're actually able to conclude that it appears it does meet it. If they don't, we're, we would actually say, no, we can't verify or we can't validate that this holds. And, you know, if you think about this idea of the partitions being independent, right, um, that sort of goes in line with this idea of isolation of variables that you see in traditional experimental design, right? Because what we're actually doing here by partitioning and independently testing every piece of the requirement as a separate requirement partition, we're essentially isolating all the variables, all of the parts of the requirement doc, and testing them independently to see if they hold. So we're not going to get in a situation where our tests all pass because they, you know, because overall in the system, uh, the test that we have passed, but there's a part of the requirement that doesn't hold, but we never actually evaluate it or it gets masked by something else. So, um, so that's something to keep in mind is that that's very much in line with this idea of isolation of variables. Um, as well, we're really doing a cause and effect, right? It does this input cause this output. Is this the effect of this input? Um, and yeah. And, and that's sort of, so I just want to, to let you know that testing in a lot of ways is like uh, using a classic scientific experimentation. 
And doing it systematically is good because with systematic, if you do things systematically, you can actually make conclusions. You can draw conclusions. Uh, if you do this ad hoc and just randomly try inputs and you find some errors, great. But you can't conclude anything from that. You can't say from that, well, I tried three ra 30 random things and I only got one that didn't work and I fixed that now. So therefore my software is good because you have no way of knowing how much of the software you test it. You have no way of knowing if all the functionality has been tested or if there's parts of the system you've never touched with your tests. You just don't know. So systematic testing leads to good experimental design, leads to the ability to have confidence and draw conclusions about the quality of the software system. Uh, no, that's a great question. So typically you can do black box testing for smaller parts of the system as well. Um, but in general, uh, what we do for black box testing, and that's sort of what's called gray box and that, uh, but in general with black box, black box testing, we're basing it on a requirements document and that would be what we would see at a system level or a component level. So for example, I could actually design a component, right? Like, and it works together with other pieces of the system. And as long as I have a spec for that that explains it, I can actually do black box testing. Okay? So I can do black box testing for parts of a system if I have the requirements for it. We'll get into more detail about um, testing at those other levels, namely the unit integration and stuff. We'll get into that in more detail. For now, let's just assume we're talking about a system level testing and we haven't really thought too much about how to test at a more finer grain detail than that. Okay? Okay. So, uh, a couple other things. Um, yeah, this is, I just put this in as a separate slide because I thought it was, it's too important not to mention uh, again. And that's that with the test input you come up with, you keep it simple, right? And you keep everything as constant as possible. You're not trying to be clever, introduce random funny things to see if you can break the code. That's not what you're trying to do here. You're trying to be systematic. And systematic means simple and constant. So if you can, you make the minimal amount of change from test to test, right? So, you know, and this again goes around with isolating variables. If, you're, if you have one test above that passes and the next test, you change three of the inputs and it fails, you don't know which input that changed actually caused the failure. But if you only change one input at a time, you can say, hey, oh, I changed the X between this test and this test, I changed the X. That's the only thing that changed. Therefore, it's the X value that's actually causing the failure. You can, it allows you to more easily and quickly isolate the underlying coding error, design error, etc., that caused the failure of the test. And the principles of being simple and constant in terms of your <coughs> choice of values, this is not something that's black box specific. It's not something that's functionality coverage specific. It's something that is systematic testing uh, applicable, widely applicable to all systematic methods. Um, okay, great. So just to recap here, functionality coverage, the system you use to create tests are first, partition the spec into separate independent requirements to test. For each independent requirement, create test cases that cover it. And you isolate causes by keeping the test value input value simple and varying only one at a time, right? So for the X and Y we looked at, if the first test case is one, one, the next one is zero, one, then zero, zero, then one zero. That allows you to, val to do them one at a time. That would be ideal for that sixth requirement we looked at previously. Okay, so that's functionality coverage. Now, I did that one first because that's the most complicated one in my mind. So I wanted your mind, I wanted you to be as sharp as possible when we talk about that, okay? Now what we're gonna talk about is another type of black box testing which is called input coverage testing. This one is, a, I think, a little bit more straightforward to understand. So I kind of put it second because now, you, you know, even if your mind is a little bit full with the other stuff, uh, this one, like I said, is a little bit easier to digest and understand. So 
Covering not the specification, the requirements themselves, but covering the inputs is the second type of coverage. And in this case, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, rather than analyzing all of the requirements in the functional spec and creating test cases based on the requirements, what we're going to do instead is we're going to analyze all the possible inputs to the system according to that functional spec and create test cases based on the inputs. Yeah, testing plausible inputs but also testing implausible inputs, okay? What we call positive and negative testing. So you're gonna to wanna to test things work and things don't work, okay? And there are different ways of doing input coverage, okay? Um, and I've got four listed here and I'm gonna talk about them. Um, there's exhaustive testing, and that's when we test every possible input. There's input partitioning, where we partition the inputs, very similar to what we did with partitioning of the requirements in the previous method. There's what's called shotgun testing, and then there's something else called robustness or boundary testing. I'm gonna go through all four of these because in each of them, they are all input coverage, but they all have a slightly different method. Remember, systematic testing has a method for creating tests and has to have a completion criterion and a way of knowing when you're done. These all have a slightly different system for creating tests and there is a different indication about when you're done okay and regardless though of what type of coverage you use in terms of input coverage the objective here is to provide confidence in the software and provide confidence that the software can correctly handle the inputs namely all the inputs hopefully that are allowed and what we mean by all is is something we'll get into um, and in fact, this is where the exhaustive comes in, right? If I truly mean all possible inputs, then I should be testing. I should have a test case for every conceivable input value, right? That's what exhaustive testing is. It says for all possible inputs, create a test case. That's the system. The completion criterion is when every input has a test case, I'm done. However, this is impractical, and I talked about this in a previous case where even if your program was as simple as take two integers and add them together, each integer, if you think about how many values can possibly be represented by an integer, and then how many can be represented by the other integer, and that you have to check every possible combination of those values, this is getting too much, right? Too many tests. So in general, all is too many for most realistic systems. And um, this is the example here, and I think uh, this is sort of outlines what I said already. You know, if you, it, it, with this addition, only this is with our, our denominator program that I talked about. Um, if you take that program that we had the spec for earlier, and you take the two integers as input, and you want it to exhaustively test all of the inputs of that program, you would basically, first off, there's an infinite number of integers. But even if you say, well, you know what? My computer doesn't have infinitely many integers. It has integers that are limited to 32 bits. You're still looking at this many, which is a lot. My finger goes out of the screen, but anyway. This many possible pairs, right? And that many test cases is too many test cases. So what you need to do is you need to come up with a compromise and a way to test for this type of example that provides you confidence in all the inputs by covering them but doesn't require you to test every single one of them. Now while this one is infeasible there are examples where exhaustive testing is actually an effective method. Here's an example we're gonna go back uh, 20 plus years now to the Y2K problem okay year 2000 problem was basically that old systems because of memory limitations uh, as an optimization programmers would save room by representing the year as only two digits so like 1988 would be 88 1901 would be 01 1999 would be 99 2001 would also be 01 just the same as 1901 that's where the problem comes in so when we hit the millennium we had a situation where hey, two digits is no longer sufficient. We actually need <clears throat> to represent all four, potentially, right? Uh, 
Um, so software had to be uh, upgraded and the representation of years had to be changed so that it was they were all four digits were supported instead of just two. <clears throat> so the way this would happen in a lot of software would be to do something like this. In the first if statement where YY1 and YY2 are two digit, you would simply do a four digit conversion for them, okay? So you would convert the two di all the two digit values will get converted to four digits and all new values you'd represent as four digits to start with. So that means if you have 99, it would convert it to 1999, for example. Okay? Make sense? Now, if we wanted to test that this if statement now works correctly, we could actually exhaustively test it because YY1 and YY2, those are two digit numbers, which means we are limited to how many numbers? 100, right? So there are 100 values for YY1, 100 values for YY2, and we can actually, and if I just uh, move this way, we can see that that's actually just 10,000 different pairs. So we can actually exhaustively test this piece of code with 10,000 tests. This piece of code, we're looking at 16 and a lot of zeros, right? So this is not feasible, 10,000 feasible. Okay, so, however, this, isn't a, this is not the, the standard, it's more the exception that it's, it's actually plausible to exhaustively test. So, when it's not ex possible, which is the majority of the time, what do you do instead? Well, if you cannot exhaustively test and you still are trying to provide input coverage as confidence for your software's correct operation, what you would do is you would most likely decide to do partitioning. So you would decide to partition the inputs in a similar way that we partition the requirements. Um, and um, the idea here is, and the most common way to do this is, it's not as natural partitioning as with the requirements where we just split them apart and make them all independent, right? Um, in this case, what we do is we partition them into what we call equivalence classes, okay? And an equivalence class characterizes some set of inputs as having commonality. For example, in, our, in, what, in the code we just looked at, we might have a partition where 0, 0, the value itself, is just 1. That single value is in one partition. And another partition of equivalent or equivalence class could be all pairs of inputs, 0 plus a non-zero value. That could be, that entire set could be an equivalence class. So you only need to have one test for all of those. One test where you have a zero followed by a non-zero. Okay? Um, or you might do something like this. Um, let's take the functional spec again. You could say, well, there are three special cases. There's a case where x is zero, the case where y is zero, and the case where neither is zero. Right? Are those my special cases? Yeah? Because those were the exception, that last requirement said that. Um, and since all the input sets are integers, we could then further partition into negative and positive. Now remember, I said let's assume positive, but if we hadn't assumed that, we would partition into negative positive. We consider the case where both x and y are both negative, x and y are both positive, x is negative, y is positive, y is negative, x is positive. You know, you do all those. And we'd end up with a set of partitions like this, okay? So this set of partitions here is seven partitions, and every single pair of x and y values for that program would fall into one of these seven partitions. Do you believe me? One person believes me. Awesome, super excited. One person believes me and everybody else, okay. Someone else said they trust me, which is, whoa, that's impressive, okay. Uh, so there's like, someone said fake news, I think, okay. Uh, yeah, just go Google and see if I'm lying, I guess, is my solution. Uh, I'm only kidding, I don't know. Um, okay, so it sounds like I'm getting, a lot of people said they believe me, except for the one person said fake, and someone says they don't believe anything anymore, which is, uh, you know, you should believe in something. 
Uh, if you can't believe, let's baby step. Let's try to believe in this, okay? So if you give me any input, any pair of numbers, I can tell you it fits into one of these groups. So someone give me a pair of numbers, X and Y values. Zero and 21. Zero and 21 fit into partition one. Another pair of numbers. Negative 384 and 18,418. Okay, uh, X is negative, that's P4 or P5. Uh, it's P5 because X is negative, Y is positive. And then someone else said 21 and 0. Uh, that's P2. X is 21, Y is 0. Can anyone think of a, of a, a pair of values that don't fit into this? No. I, you know, if you can, great. Uh, but we can guarantee that every pair of X and Y you come up with fit into one of these. So that's good because our partition provides coverage of the space of possible inputs. That's what we want. Now, the next step after you do this partitioning, right, is uh, you have to come up with values. Now, I saw somebody else ask just then, why are you guaranteed to get numbers as inputs? Okay. Um, so if you remember and go back to requirements, it says it takes two numbers as inputs. That was part of the requirements. So numbers are expected. Now, if it didn't say that, it just said you takes two values, you would also have to have partitions to cover non-numbers uh, non as well, right? Characters, symbols, etc. But the requirement we started with said two integers, two numbers. But it's a good question. And that's the kind of thinking you need to have if you want to be really successful at testing, is you have to be thinking constantly about what are the edge cases that sort of break this or what are am I covering everything and that's the kind of thinking you need to have it's very helpful to think about that okay so um, yeah users hardly ever follow rules yeah so yeah you need that's why if you want to make a system robust you need to you need to actually include the ability for it to handle incorrectly formatted input gracefully in this case because we're just starting we're not worrying about that, um, but but that is something um, you do have to think about. Okay, so we have all these partitions. What's the next step here? The next step is to actually come up with test cases. Okay, if you if I asked you to do input partition testing on that description I gave you uh, on the test on a test, and you gave me this, you would get half marks because what you've given me are partitions and not test cases. If I ask you to input partition testing, you need to give me actual test cases. So the, this is the halfway step. You've got the partitions. The next thing is you have to give me values for all of these. Um, and so we need a test case for every partition. And what else? The values of the test cases need to be as simple as possible and have as little variation as possible. So, what would we be thinking here? What do you think would be some good values here? One's a negative one. So yeah, I mean, that might be a good thing. So if we kind of go through here and do this, we might end up with something like this. And normally, if we were in class, I'd probably go through and do this on the board as an act and work through the solution. Unfortunately, it's sort of tough to do it. Um, but I'd encourage you to try to kind of work through some of these on your own if you want or try something slightly different. Um, so in this case here, uh, everywhere where it said non-zero, we just used a one. Everywhere where it said a negative number, we used negative one. Everywhere it said a positive number, we used one. And that allowed us to have values for all of our tests, right? So now, unlike back here where we had P1 to P7, partition 1 to partition 7. Once we put values, we've completed the task of doing input partition testing because we now have T1 to T7, test 1 to test 7. Okay? However, 
What do you notice there? Remember I said we should have assumed it was positive, but you know, that was that's probably what should have been the case. Well, it turns out in this case, we by blindly following our partition values, we've got some negatives in here, right? But that was probably not intended, right? Someone doing that program probably didn't mean for negatives to be here. So at this point, we might realize this and we can exclude these partitions. We could also not realize it at this point and then what we do instead is once we start running the tests, we either get some funny values or our software doesn't handle negatives gracefully, in which case we realize there's a gap in our requirements. So the, the nice thing about going through this process is this can be a great way to find errors in the specification, uh, which, and if you find them in the spec and fix them, it is way cheaper, as I've told you before, versus finding them later in the source code or in production even. So uh, just a recap, blindly following the input partitioning here led to negatives, which we probably didn't intend, so it exposed this problem that was in our spec. Um, and this is kind of a, a neat result here because it says like, you know, often you can find failures or problems using systematic testing that aren't actually required, um, you know, no tests failed to find this problem, right? We found this problem because doing the testing allowed us to more deeply understand the requirements and understand something was missing. So. Uh, we can actually improve our quality of our code by testing, by creating the test, and not even by executing them. Okay, so uh, just a recap here. In terms of input partitioning, um, this is actually um, uh, the advantages of doing this. Obviously, I've already talked about it versus exhaustive, but it is very intuitive in general, breaking it apart this way. Um, in general, most testers have a reasonably, uh, I, I hate saying things are easy, but they have a reasonably a reasonable amount of success at identifying good partitions. Um, and uh, it's easy to say when you're done because every, once you've partitioned all the input space into partitions, once you have a test case for every single partition, you're done. As well, if every input fits in a partition and every test, there's a test for every partition, then we're testing essentially, we have a representative test for all the values and we therefore have some confidence that the program is at least capable of handling all the different kinds of inputs. Okay? Now, that's exhaustive and input partitioning. I also said there were two others which I'm gonna cover very quickly. One of them is this idea of shotgun testing. And shotgun testing is actually not a systematic method. It's actually uh, more just about random method. Um, so in the case of shotgun, what we're trying to do is we're verifying outputs that are legal and then trying illegal ones to make sure the program doesn't crash. So the idea that you mentioned here, we may even try letters and stuff if it didn't include the fact they all have to be numbers. Um, this can be very practical and easy to do, um, but uh, it isn't a systematic method because there's no way of knowing when we're finished and there's no real system for creating tests except randomness. So a set of shotgun tests would look something like this. X and Y values where you have random X, random Y's. And so on and so on. And the so on is interesting because there's a question of when am I finished? When do I have enough random tests? Maybe it's when I hit a thousand, but is that really a good indicator? So um, this black box um, shotgun testing uh, is not actually, it's, it's a black box method, but it's not a systematic method uh, because it doesn't have a completion criterion. It does have a system for creating tests, which is random, but it doesn't have any way of telling you when you're done. So uh, if you want to have confidence with this, because there's no way of knowing that you've got enough tests, you really need to do a large number of tests to have any degree of confidence here. Okay? However, 
There is a hybrid method that some people use which does provide this a little bit more uniform or a little bit more systematic and that's to do what, what's called input partition shotgun testing. You take the the best of both methods. So you take all your input partitions like we did before in input partition testing but rather than coming up with just one simple test you can still do that but then for each of the individual partitions you then randomly create a bunch more tests in there using the shotgun strategy. And just by doing these extra tests in each partition you can have a little more confidence is the idea. Okay, uh, but in terms of the experimental design and what we've talked about, you run your simple test first, then you run your random test. Don't do the random testing first. The simple test first, then the random. So you gain the confidence you get from doing input partitioning. You gain further confidence by doing random tests that supplement what you already learned from the input partitioning is the strategy. Okay, and the very last thing I want to mention is what's called input boundary testing. And I want to get this covered today because input uh, boundary testing and input robustness testing, this is actually, um, this covers up to basically a lot of what you need to be able to complete that phase one of the project where you're creating a black box test based on a requirement. Um, so the idea here about robustness testing is is that you want to test that the program doesn't crash or halt unexpectedly. So that's what you're trying to do. One way of doing that is what's called shotgun robustness testing where you do random garbage input. Um, that's also called fuzzing in the security context. So you try a whole bunch of values and see if any of them break it. Um, or another way of doing it is what's called boundary value robustness testing. And with boundary values, does anyone know what a boundary value is? Yes. Okay. What is it? A value clamp between two limits. Um, <clears throat> it's more, that's not quite how I would describe it, but um, a boundary value is a value uh, that's the boundary between legal and illegal values. Okay. So remember with that example I talked about with withdrawal of cash if you're doing ATM software? If you have a $500 limit, right? $500 is a legal value. $499 is a legal value. $488 is a legal value. $501, not. So this isn't about a mathematical definition of boundary. It's about uh, a testing definition, which is, is I think where, yeah which is where you're, uh, where, where the sort of discrepancy lies. And I should have been clear that I meant boundary in terms of testing. So uh, what we're interested in doing with boundary values here is that we find all those boundaries between legal and illegal values, right? Things like you can't withdraw up to $500. You can only withdraw up to $500. And then what you do is you test right around the range to see that it handles it, okay? Um, and so that means uh, you'll actually be testing 499, say 500 and 501, or maybe 499.99, 500 and 500 dollars and one cent to make sure you know which ones fail and which ones pass. Um, if we had a pro another example is if we had a sort program where we expected a list of sorted numbers, um, those types of programs often fail when you give it a list of zero or one numbers, right? or exactly as large as the largest one, so the end of array problem. So like if you say, oh yeah, a list of 500 numbers, and that's the max. If someone tries to give you 501 numbers, it fails. If someone, So what you typically do is you test those boundaries to make sure that um, it's working. And the kind of way for the boundary values, uh, what you want to be testing here is with the boundaries, how you do systematic input boundary testing is is that you basically find for all boundaries between legal and illegal values, you test at the boundary and immediately above and below. And you're done when every boundary has test has been tested. Okay? Great. So 
that concludes what I want to talk about today. I know I covered a lot, but um, that covers what I want to do today. So the first half I did the uh, functionality coverage. I just finished then input coverage, which included exhaustive testing, uh, input partitioning, shotgun, which we learned is not systematic, but is a black box method. And lastly, robustness testing, including boundary testing. Um, so given that we've covered two of the three types of black box, you can guess that on Monday, we will cover the final method, which is output coverage. Uh, and that will conclude then our black box uh, testing discussion. Um, if you want to read ahead, the lecture notes for today and the lecture notes for Monday are already posted on the course website. Um, and as always, I'll stick around for a minute if you have any questions.